Uh, my name is Esther Mackay. <coughs> I work for Signicat. I work on two of the four large-scale pilots uh, for the European Digital Identity Wallets, and in one of them, EWC, I'm responsible for interoperability and testing. So uh, I've got a lot of on my mind, and if you have any technical details, find me during the lunch break, because today we're going to talk about a lot of other stuff regarding EIDAS2 and the wallets. Um, we've got three fabulous speakers lined up who all have a different angle on this. Um, and um, let's, you know, given the time restrictions, let's start off immediately. Um, I know he's got uh, packed slides, but don't worry, they will be shared afterwards. And um, please give it up for Jörg. Jörg, welcome and uh, take it away. So good morning. Thanks very much for the invitation to Utrecht, actually. And uh, when we look into the state of identity, then we also need to look into the state of those players that are in the digital trust services market. As you know, under AIDAS 2, Article 24 is looking into some sort of more harmonization. And this is dealing with remote identification. So time to look into a market that is currently still quite fragmented on a European basis. If you would look into the EU trusted list, then you'll find nine qualified electronic signature and trust service providers in the Netherlands. 14, for example, in countries like Germany, and more than 50 in Spain. And I'm for Namirial Group, so just if you haven't heard that name, that's actually a company that is headquartered in Italy, that's got some subsidiaries in France and Spain, in Germany, Austria and Romania, so on a pan-European basis. And I'd like to share you a little bit about the background of how we perceive the market as of today. <clears throat> When we look into what's officially available, there is a statistics overview on the European Commission website, where you can see those, meanwhile, three, 239 players in the market of providing qualified <laughs> trust services. And um, there is a little bit of a shift of up and down in that market, and there is a different market environment from country to country. So in those three countries where we are seeing most of these QTSPs operating, that's actually Spain, France, and Italy, we have a strong push from the government, from the public sector, uh, also to provide the appropriate use cases. While in some other countries, like in Germany, where I'm coming from, um, we are seeing a very sluggish adoption of electronic identities that are based on smart card systems. So if you look into this overview over the years, then you can see that there are different market backgrounds and different market players. Some of them strongly tied to public authorities and to the government, while others are more on the private sector. When we try to map this, not just looking into the state of play, but actually really looking into a kind of map, that's what I'm trying to map over the years and with the support of many of you that are in the room and that also may be watching this uh, as a recording. It is the attempt to have an overview of which players we are seeing in the private sector as a public player, public sector player, and as PPPs, private-public partnerships. <clears throat> And that market segment, well, I'll need to change this almost every month now, as we are seeing some market exits and we're seeing new players entering into that market. The interesting question is, how many of these organizations are actually profitable? And how many of these organizations do have a road towards profitability in the year 2024-2025? And uh, as we had the uh, Russian aggression on Ukraine last year, we were seeing that easy money, for example, from private equities is no longer available on the market. So several of these market <coughs> players, they had to face tough decisions. On the one hand side, because of funding. On the other side, because of delays in the process of what has been proposed as probably already live next year with the EDAS 2, but got a little bit postponed on the way along. 
When we look into the actual adoption, these are numbers that have been shown last week at the Digital Identity Observatory in Milan. This is not the complete overview. What they were looking into primarily were non-smart card based digital identity systems. And you in the Netherlands are in a very favorable position, whereas I'm as a German citizen, well, <clears throat> we do have with our smart card based version of EID or national identity, a very low adoption rate. <laughs> I know this from Ronny Schrumpf from ING. He's actually working in Germany and trying to push towards an adoption for electronic identification on national ID card for digital onboarding in banking. And he envies, of course, his friends in the Netherlands uh, with a much, much higher adoption rate of these digital identity schemes. There's a bunch of reasons for that. Uh, one of the reason is, well, Sometimes it is the overcomplexity, and Germany, for example, tends to overregulate things over time. So, in order to understand to go cross border and which of these systems are actually working and which don't, you really have to look into the actual user experience that these systems are providing. And we know this from our friends from Signicat, uh, they also collaborate with VeryMe and others. And well, we do have a very low adoption rate in some of the countries for these digital schemes. When looking at to this market as a qualified trust service provider, of course, the need to identicate people is rising. And so there is a lot of opportunities for players in that market. And we are seeing that some, for example, from the banking sector are interested in becoming a qualified trust service provider by themselves. So one of the trends underlying in this market is that you can see that several companies are offering trust services as a service or PKI as a service. So if you look into the 239 players in that market segment, you can drill down a little bit deeper and find that some of them are relying on the same infrastructure. One example is a company based in Spain <coughs> called Wanataka, a qualified trust service provider on their own, but also providing services to others in this overview. So <clears throat> I do not talk through all of the details of AIDAS 2 of the upcoming revision, but what we are discussing here is mostly the topic around the digital identity wallet. There are other aspects in this AIDAS 2 segment as well. For example, qualified website certificates. There is the stuff around remote identification and electronic ledgers as well as electronic archives. So as already mentioned by Jacoba this morning, the um, idea to have the implementing acts for all of that stuff done within a year is a very challenging one. And the ecosystem is a complex one. She was talking about the good, the bad, and the complex. And I'd say it's very complex. When you try to talk about the AIDAS 2 ecosystem, it's actually a slide provided by a company called Lissy Adrian Dirk. He tried to map all the roles and responsibilities. If you start the conversation, you should rather go on a very high level and first of all, explain the concept of what is a PID provider, electronic attributes, and now discuss this based on a use case. We tend as technicians and also as people with a legal background, we tend to talk often within our own bubble. At the end of the day, people want to get stuff done. And so it matters really of what you can actually do with it. That's where Germany has a little issue because we are lacking still for our electronic identity the actual the smart triggering use cases where you really have to use it. So when looking into this overview here, let's stick down deeper into when that's going to actually happen. So if I want to become as a trust service provider, a provider for qualified electronic attribute attestation, at which point in time am I able to really judge if this is a business to make money with? Well, for that purpose, you will need to look into the actual milestone plan. 
There is currently, as far as I know, no official overview with a lot of details from the European Commission or the Parliament or the Council, because this is an ever-changing milestone plan. The most recent change was we've expected November 28 that there would have been a voting in the ITRA committee of the European Parliament. It was postponed to December 7 due to the fact that some of the little texts were not especially to the level of detail that was requested. And so you can see me updating this overview almost on a weekly basis. Um, the implementing acts, if that's really going to happen, that we'll see the implementing acts finished by December 2024. Well, we are hoping for that, but as we heard, there are some unknown unknowns along the road. There are also some interactions <coughs> between those various deliverables. Uh, we will be hearing about the large scale pilots very soon, um, that there are four different ones. Most of them are waiting for the actual reference implementation that initially was planned to be available mid of 2023. Now, we hope that we might get something by the end of the year, but it also still could be January. So the actual work on the implementation to work on stuff is a little bit postponed. You can see also that other stuff is not published, like the architectural reference framework being discussed behind closed doors with its version 1.2 since June. Now we expect that there will be something published in a version 1.3 by December and a few other versions going down the road towards January and February. So the actual interplay of reference implementation, working with that in the large-scale pilot, adjusting the architectural reference framework again, and to make it work together with the legal file. This is work in a lot of progress. So the opportunities for the digital trust services. There's been an overview from Observatorium BIS. Some of you may know Michael Tabor. He's actually together with Arno Fiedler trying to map the opportunities around AIDAS 2. And uh, that was a small survey among just something like about 25 participants. Um, but this is the only one that I know that has a little bit of a scientific background when it comes to what is expected to be the most attractive uh, factors for digital trust service providers. And you can see the attestation of attributes is uh, considered as being very popular. That's also been seen in a similar way when the Cloud Signature Consortium met just uh, November 23. But in order to actually judge if this is a business for the private sector, there are some missing pieces. And this is a, one of the list of someone that is currently working on a master thesis. The guy is called Jens Kursave, and he made an overview about what are the unknown unknowns and what are challenges and obstacles. If we would have a little bit of more time, and maybe that's an ID for <coughs> ID Next Association, to provide actually a survey of what in your perspective is currently the most important stumbling block. From what I am hearing in my LinkedIn bubble, in my X bubble and other conversation forums I am around, it is the lack of enough information to build a real solid business plan and also to get an idea about the monetarization and the impacts of, for example, government national decisions. So to challenge with regards to the adoption. Again, something from the Digital Identity Observatory that you can follow up on LinkedIn as well. And they ask their primarily Italian peers, well, what percentage of users would like to store their identity documents in a government-provided wallet? And based on the background where you're coming from, whether you're from Norway or whether you're from Sweden, Finland, the Netherlands, or Italy, Spain, or France, etc. Trust in governments will, that's my point of view, reflect in trust and adoption of digital identity wallets that are issued by the government. And so we may see that there is a slow adoption in some countries where we have a lack in trust and government. <clears throat> Another aspect, 
when we look on that segment, we need to look into the national approaches. So for example, in Germany, um, we do also have a national policy decision that is not understood by some of our friends in the other parts of the European Union. Due to some miserably failed plug train projects, there is currently a little back push towards anything around distributed ledger technology. Well, there should be a use for uh, uh, the blockchain or distributed ledger technology in the digital identity environment. So there are several priorities and Germany tries to make a transparent process in order towards building an uh, ecosystem that is sustainable around these digital identity wallets. In Germany we have an organization called GovLab.de that sits underneath the German Federal Ministry of Interior and uh, they publish what they are having in their research and you can also see where there are several issues that are not working according to plan. For example, if you are following the German market for a while closely, you've heard about announcement that there will be a smart EID. Smart EID, not to be confused with the one in the Baltics, that's with a similar name. In the German environment, it should be that users of a Samsung smartphone should be enabled to have their national ID card actually on their smartphone. And that project is now delayed for something like three years. It sits currently in the stage where the official announcement is there should be a start in late 2023. There can't be, because the money for operating the system is yet under discussion in the federal budget 2024. And that's another influence we all will need to look into. Actually, where is the money coming from? And is it secured under the now more critical aspects when looking into federal budgets 2024, 2025? Will funding, for example, for some of the initiatives that was announced, will that funding be actually available? As long as the budget is not finished, you cannot securely plan with these kind of initiatives. And so this overview also has something positive. When you want to look into the aspects for the EID wallet architecture currently being discussed in Germany, there are three concepts and that have just been published last week. So for those that want to dig deeper into the consideration of building a government-built <coughs> wallet, uh, Moritz Heuberger, also one of the key people in the large-scale pilots of potential consortium, he was announcing that. These are the l paths towards such an ecosystem. So looking into the use cases, understanding, for example, what kind of business models could be created around that. Privacy aspects, architecture aspects. And that's an open conversation and most of the stuff can be followed if you just access the GitHub thing. As mentioned before, if you just want to have these slides urgently, just pass an email to me or send a LinkedIn message, etc. I'm more than happy to share. Four large-scale pilots. We will be hearing about the other ones from my fellow speakers just shortly. Um, Namirial, for example, is engaged in potential. So, Jörg, what's actually happening in potential? First of all, it's a huge consortium. So 148 companies, and now Muriel just being one of them, um, in order to understand of who from your country is engaging in this consortia, this is the overview of the actual players in it. And there are six use cases being addressed, while others are just addressing one or two use cases in these consortia. In potential, you can find a bunch of them, and several countries having the lead, for example, QES, remote qualified electronic signature for signing documents. In this case, Mr. Leithold from ASIT, from the Austrian organization, has the lead. So where are we standing time-wise? Well, these red arrows show that we are facing a few delays. As mentioned before, the actual reference implementation is not yet available, so this is what this the red line here is showing there is also a little bit of a delay in terms of the actual legal file and of course in the rollout of corresponding technology like the smart EID. 
Um, this particular overview was created, unfortunately, just for the German audience only, but it is also available now, thanks to ID Next Association, in sharing it here. So that's a kind of a quick overview. What are they doing now? Because they do not have the reference wallet implementation. Well, potential is, for example, looking into the actual requirements. So if I want to do a digital onboarding, for example, for an account opening, what do I need to do? And so that concludes a very quick rush through. Uh, well, I would say the tip of the iceberg, <laughs> but icebergs, John is very much more familiar with icebergs than myself. We're covering a few more icebergs, Esther, and so that concludes my session part for the moment. I'm, I'm very impressed. Uh, any less capable speaker would have derailed that set of slides completely. And like your sets, uh, there have been some delays, mainly because the architectural reference framework and um, the reference implementation aren't available yet. However, I also know that some of the LSPs have wallet providers in their um, uh, participants. So uh, I can tell you that, for example, in EWC, we've already started the first integrations with three demo wallets. So it's not everyone is just working on requirements. Annette, can I give you the floor, yes. please? Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Annette Steenbergen, and um, I've been working in digital identity and travel for uh, the past 11, 12 years, uh, and before that, always in uh, international border management. So it's a bit of my background. Uh, first of all, thank you to Robert Hoskamp and the ID Next team for uh, inviting me to uh, be able to present, but also to uh, participate in that way and, and listen to all the other fantastic presentations. Um, today, I'll be talking to you about the EU Digital Wallet Consortium, which is one of the, con one of the four consortiums that is uh, uh, performing uh, the large-scale pilot or in preparation now of the large-scale pilot. And I'll be looking at the um, uh, travel use case and uh, and talk about the consortium and a bit of the beyond use cases. Um, the disclaimer. Back to basics first. Uh, I always like to start with, uh, with that. AI does, again, it means electronic identification, authentication, authentication trust services regulation. Well, uh, Jörg just also uh, explained a lot about that, of course. Where does it come from? Um, the need uh, that any citizen anywhere in Europe, crossing borders, um, together with free movement of people, free movement of services and free movement of goods, of course, this is part of it, uh, has a technology where we can control the data that we share and to whom we share and uh, <coughs> how we share that and how it is used, uh, which is, uh, I think, an urgent need in uh, our digital world. Um, by 2026, every member state should have a uh, make a digital identity wallet uh, available to all citizens. Whether that is uh, um, uh, reached at that time, well, we will we'll see. But uh, of course, the goal is to ensure electronic interaction between citizens, uh, residents, businesses, government services, etc., are um, uh, faster, efficient, more secure, no matter where. Going back to basics, what is a verifiable credential or in uh, EU uh, terms, uh, regulation terms, an electronic attestation of attributes? Uh, it can represent information found in physical uh, credentials, of course, uh, like uh, your uh, identity card, your driver's license, your um, uh, diploma, uh, your uh, education could be your, uh, something that you can also not find physically, uh, which is a bank account. Um, but it could be that your paper uh, prescription for drugs, which you, you nowadays receive from, your, uh, which you receive from your GP, you will get that in a digital form. Um, uh, as Katrina already said, endless uh, possibilities. Uh, and I always like to say that in 10 years time, we will say to each other, why didn't we think of that 10 years ago? Because that is what we're facing. Uh, and the identity wallets are, um, they allow the users to store those verifiable credentials. And of course, the most important thing is that they are self-sovereign and private, 
which is a big difference to, words, to the physical credentials that we use, because now if I hand over my passport, I give you too much information, uh, because there's information in there that you're not allowed to have. And when I, have, when I give you a digital uh, credential, I will be able to perform selective disclosure, uh, hopefully, or the, the, uh, the software will help me perform the uh, selective disclosure and I will only uh, need what I share what I need to share and the other person is the other organization is allowed to have to perform a service so an issuer issues uh, a verifiable credential I will hold it on my uh, mobile device uh, and I will be able to self sovereign share it with a relying party who is basically the verifier and who can verify that that credential is uh, secure, signed, and we'll be able to do that instantly. Uh, whereby, going back again to basics, with a passport, you basically need to know uh, what are the security features of a physical document before you can truly verify that it's a real document. Now, what does it mean for travel? How, what will this look like in practice in the future? The government will issue us a national ID or, uh, of course, our PIT, uh, to have the EU wallet, uh, which will be at the core of it. Uh, and uh, that is for travel always start step number one. Now, there is a little, I'll make a little detour here. If we travel within the EU, we can do so with our EU identity card. We don't need to always show our passport. Uh, if we go extra EU, we need to have a passport. Um, which we have internationally agreed on, that uh, that is how we can identify another passport issued to you by your government. You go to another government, and that government can check whether that's a verified passport and whether that belongs to you. Interesting question, what will happen is within the EU, will we get uh, our national ID card as a verifiable credential? Or will we be able to travel with just a PIT? I don't know. It's going to be an interesting question. Then we have a uh, international uh, digital travel credential with ICAO, uh, the International Civil Aviation, which is the uh, UN body that deals with uh, travel documents. Um, and um, they've issued standards um, for a digital travel credential, which is a, a, a basically a digital file uh, from your passport, <coughs> not fully your passport, digital file from your passport. So there's going to be three types. I'll just stick to the first one, uh, which is self-derived, using your physical document and your mobile device. Not sure yet how we will use that in uh, the wallet, um, but it would be great if we could, because uh, the whole travel use case depends on uh, using a um, official document to travel because an airline needs to verify that you are in possession of a document which allows you to travel from A to B otherwise they aren't allowed they can't take you on board that's called the carrier responsibility so it's not just uh, about uh, the government issuing one it's about private parties also being able to recognize these if you check into a hotel often you need to share your passport nowadays there's still I was in Spain, they still make copies of your passport or you need to send in a copy of your passport. I'm sharing way too much information and somebody is storing it on a server. Very scary idea because if you have my passport details, you have my biometrics, you have my national number, you have basically all of me uh, in that respect. So a little detour uh, uh, on that uh, government issued national ID, which we need to have in a uh, official form. Um, and with that, we can uh, book a flight, uh, probably using a PIT, I think, for now. Um, if we have booked a flight, then the travel agency or the airline will issue us a verifiable credential, the ticket. Um, the hotel we booked will issue us a voucher in the form of verifiable credential. Um, and by the time we are about to uh, uh, reach the hotel, we'll probably receive our key as in the, the hotel room key in the form of a verifiable credential. And another interesting uh, development that we should uh, realize that we will prepare for, if you travel to the US right now, you ask for an ESTA. We all know this. Um, Europe will get the ATS, 
but uh, going to Australia, you also need to get an electronic travel authorization. Now, this means we have a digitization of the uh, admissibility process uh, that is becoming the norm in uh, border management. So we will, uh, in the future, if we go to the US, we'll do that electronically and uh, like we do now, but we will share probably uh, a version of our uh, ICAO digital travel credential because the US government wants to know at the highest level of assurance that I am who I am uh, and that the, the, the Dutch government has issued uh, this to me. If I am then allowed to travel to the US, because it's not a visa, it's an electronic travel authorization, um, I will receive from, the, from that country, whether it's Australia, whether it's the US, and the EU will do the same, a verifiable credential that says I'm allowed to travel to that country. I will use that. This is not written in stone, but I think this is, this is predicted how this will go. I will use that to share it with the airline <coughs> and say, I'm allowed to travel to the US. The airlines are going to be extremely happy with this because they don't have to check anymore. So their carrier responsibility will be uh, uh, taken away from them, which saves them millions and millions of euros. Um, and uh, they will have a verified identity that they can use uh, for me uh, to check who I am, if I am who I say I am. So the wallets and uh, verifiable credentials will change the way we travel hugely and it makes the process much easier and faster because we will if we consent we will be able to say by the way uh, i want to use my biometrics when i uh, 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 check in for a flight i'll do that at home right you do that at home you get the message i'll check in for a flight and they say by the way do you want to use our seamless passenger facilitation with biometrics yeah i would like to because it's much faster uh, so it will make the whole we call that passenger facilitation process, much more seamless, uh, uh, touchless, but at the same time, because you have a high level of assurance for the identity, uh, it makes it much more safer. And this is where airlines are very happy because it's done for them, but also governments are very happy, of course, because not only do they know you're coming, but they have a higher level of assurance that you are who you say you are. But, um, Looking at the beyond, uh, of course, the use cases are endless. Um, again, like I said, our GP will issue us a, a prescription after they verified that we are insured with a verifiable credential, issues as a prescription. I'm traveling, I'm on holiday in Italy, and I will go to the pharmacy because I just lost my whatever, ask my medication, and I will go to the pharmacy and they will be able to verify that I indeed am eligible for one more round of this uh, medicine uh, and be able to issue it um, or sell it to me. Uh, I'll also maybe in the future show my uh, European health insurance uh, and have that linked as well. That would be fantastic. But of course, um, applying for a job in Sweden, I will uh, show them that I have a bachelor's or I have a master's, etc. Okay. The EWC will focus on um, the travel use case, hence uh, uh, what I just presented, and, uh, but also organizational digital identity and uh, support for payment. Um, it has 60 members. Thanks, Jörg, for giving that little overview uh, there. Showed some of the members. Uh, we have, uh, for payments, very important visa. We have, uh, for travel, we have Amadeus. I don't know if you know that, but that's like a huge uh, IT provider for airlines and airports. Um, we have uh, Signicat, we have uh, Gen Digital, but we also have a ferry company in Greece, uh, the Swiss Railway Services. Um, we have uh, Finnair and Condor Air. Um, so a very interesting uh, set of uh, um, organizations. Uh, driving member states are Sweden and Finland, uh, but many other uh, are involved as well. The Dutch Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs and Climate, Economics and Climate Affairs, Economic Affairs and Climate Affairs. I don't know. Anyway, eco eco Economics and Climate Affairs is also involved. Um, and 
the environment of the EWC. I don't want to repeat too much of what uh, York just said, but of course it starts with the regulation. Uh, we need uh, the ARF, which we've seen uh, is now up to version 6 or 7, I saw. This will be under continuous development, I, I guess, uh, but crucial. We need the Implementation Act, hopefully, uh, York, what was, when did you expect the Implementation Act? Implementation Act for what? Uh, for the AIDAS. Well, uh, currently the official version is by December 2024. Okay, so that, that should be there. Say, as of today. Yeah. It, it, will, okay. be, it will be delayed, uh, yeah. hopefully, because uh, a lot of the standards that the um, implementing X, one of the things you need to realize is that governments cannot directly reference some of the standardization bodies like the ITF and W3C. So those standards need to be embedded in the implementing acts in order for governments to be able to, to reference them or reference by ETSI-SIM. And we're hoping that there will be a slight delay so we can take um, the verifiable credentials on board as well as the ISO uh, and DOC standards. Yeah. Just very quickly, why are they not allowed to do it directly, Esther? That's a legal matter. Right, okay. okay. But not for now, but yeah. I think because W3C is not an official UN body. It's not. It doesn't. It doesn't have a treaty underneath, uh, uh, whereby it's a super. With the legal entity of the standardization bodies. Sorry. It has to do with the legal yeah. entity of the standardization bodies. If it becomes, if there is, I don't know if there's a UN body that. Could Let's take this to the break. Yeah. Finish anyway. your. Yeah. Um, <laughs> another interesting. What we need, of course, is the uh, the wallet reference implementation, which is in a parallel track, um, and then we have the large scale pilots. Yeah. yeah. Oh, first, the first, it's 12 o'clock, it's noon. Is it not? Because it's the first Monday of the month. This is very normal in the Netherlands. Well, outside you will also have all these alarms. Keep calm and carry on. Wrapping up, uh, the EU Digital Wallet Consortium uh, is uh, very ambitious uh, because it basically has three use cases in one. Travel, um, which is of course cross-border by default. Of course, we need to, if we talk about within Europe and extra Europe, and I'm, I hope we can do something crossing an extra EU border because that's for travel extremely interesting because all the travel standards, whether you're in EU or out EU or outside of EU, are basically the same. So, um, from a personal perspective, um, but it will be boarding a plane, uh, booking a flight, hotel, uh, but also a ferry, uh, train, etc. Organizational digital identity, extremely interesting. Um, organizations from large to <coughs> small medium enterprises need to identity to cross border and they have a, a huge need for this. There's a, that sentence needs to be adjusted. <laughs> <laughs> Something wrong there. Um, there is a big need for an interoperable ecosystem, but that's very difficult. Um, and uh, it will have a lot of added value, which I think is a no-brainer, but uh, how to get there is, is difficult. So this is um, very ambitious, but extremely important. And of course, there's payments. We all use payments already, but this will be within the, the wallet. Uh, so that will be a... a daily thing that we will all uh, experience. That's it. Thank you very much. And uh, we can have some questions later. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Annette is an expert on travel and thank you for reminding us that when we talk about identity, it's not just your passport, it's not just DigiD. And in the context of international border crossings, identity is a very tough topic. Uh, so thank you for that. Okay, so great to be here again. I've been to a lot of IDNext events. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to be the party pooper in the, this party. <laughs> but don't get me wrong, I'm a technology optimist. I am a technology optimist. I, I think what we're doing here is, is uh, really good, I, uh, positive, and I really liked Annette's uh, presentation on the travel. That made me a little bit more optimistic. But I'll, I'll be touching on, on some topics and some challenges. And as you know, I did a presentation last year about the people aspect. And I mean, as, as um, Katrina said, we are identity nerds, right? We, we think of things through the identity nerd. 
I happen to talk to normal people from time to time. It's, it, you should try it. It's a, it's a really good experience to, to figure out what's their view on the world, you know, that are not with their head stuck in this identity. Um, so I'll touch on, on three of the challenges I've seen. Uh, the binding between the carbon-based and the silicon-based. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? <laughs> right. How is that done? Um, I learned, I, I talked to some people from the Norwegian uh, Population Registry uh, last week, and they said very few countries in the world actually have uh, to, to issue your passport or your identity card. You need to be present physically, and the picture is taken there. In most cases, you bring your picture, then you have the morphing attack. So already starting from that point, there could be a doubt, is this the right person? We need to be able to trust the link between the person and the wallet. And we need to trust that the user of the wallet is the owner. Right? If you can't trust that link, and I present I'm over 18, which I really am, but, <laughs> but how can you trust it? If you don't trust this link, I present link, I'm allowed to travel to this country. If you cannot trust this is mine, that somebody else has used it. If it's a more photo, then somebody else is using it. That's a big challenge. And the verifiable claims are worthless if you can't trust this. It breaks down. We need to have a complete chain of trust. And this is a challenge with the links. And of course, yeah, uh, this morning was talk about you know, the dynamic, dynamic biometrics uh, and things, and we need to look into better mechanisms for that. And of course, there are different ways of sharing. Somebody could uh, attack it and use it on your behalf. Or you could be tricked into using your identity for something, but also sharing. There was a report now showing that in Norway, using bank ID, 20% of people are sharing their credentials, letting somebody else use it. This could be to help your parents to, you know, on behalf of children, but also sharing with police and, and, and uh, social services. And that is a problem. So you cannot really trust that the owner is the user. And also about half of these people have been frauded in some way or another. So that's one thing. We really need to fix that. We need to build a basic trust that you can trust both that the identity belongs to the right person, so the sort of point of entry, but also that the user is the owner. Really important. Business model. OK, that's a recurring uh, theme, right? Every time we talk about, uh, start talking about this, you know, the discussion goes out to something else. We talk about all the cool stuff we can do and stuff. And yeah, we can do a lot of cool stuff. But I think we are confusing some issues here. Um, I started thinking about roads. OK, imagine we didn't have roads, right? And now we say, OK, we've got this really great concept that can move people and goods faster around. We need to build what we call roads. Uh, and then we need to convince also somebody to buy the creative vehicles to drive on these roads. But we don't know what the roads look like yet, right? So how would you ba make the vehicles? And you don't even know if the roads are going to be a success. So why would you start investing in a vehicle? So we have this challenge with building the infrastructure, the core identity, the onboarding, the, the core technology, and then the use cases on top of that. Are we mixing this? Are we creating this more complex by looking at this in the same bubble? So how do we invest the issuers and the lying party? How do we convince them to invest in this? If you don't have roads, how do you convince somebody to construct a car? Because you don't know how wide it's going to be or what's, uh, you know, all that stuff. Um, and of course, you can, uh, uh, yeah, this one, the identity part of yeah, that's, yeah, this one was not really a success. So maybe we need to look at sort of building the core trust infrastructure. Should that be an infrastructure project <laughs> from government, like water, like electricity? All of these were originally set up by governments. Just a thought. Maybe we need to split this thinking. And then I'm looking for the excitement. And not by us. I mean, we are nerds, right? We are so excited. But talking to normal people about this, they are not really dancing on the floor when I you know, talk about this. You know, th this is what we tell them. Hey, you can, 
you know, one set of credentials. You can prove you're over 18. So you can use this to buy beer and or access adult services. Yay. You can prove who you are. You can log in across EU, you know, limited disclosure. <sighs> you know, this stuff doesn't ex really excite people, right? And we have all these use cases. I, I really like the way you presented this with the education, I think. Uh, sorry about the travel. I think that could be one, and I'm touching on that myself. But all these other use cases, will people get excited about them? Without people, there is no wallet. There is no success, unless we can get people on board. We need to create something that people will say, wow, when can I get this? If you present this in the Nordics, <laughs> What's the problem we solve? We go, hey, we solved this 10 years ago. We have bank ID, we log into everything. Right? What do we need a wallet for? And you know, sharing data with government, I don't care, I trust the government, no worries. And to the rest of, of Europe, well, we still haven't really got a single ID, EID. So how will the EID wallet solve this problem? This is about trust, this is about reluctance. Germany was mentioned. Uh, where you are much more privacy concerned than the rest of, of, uh, of Europe. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the NPA is the most secure EID in the world, right? Because nobody's using it, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it, it's because of lack of trust, right? And it's not like it's, oh, but now we got the wallet, which is, by the way, issued by the government. This is going to change everything. No, it's not. Unless we get people aboard and get them excited. So what makes people excited? Well, if I can simplify something. Hey, we see that with the Apple Wallet, right? It simplifies. And back to the travel use case. I put all my boarding passes, my tickets and stuff, go in my Apple Wallet. So, so why do I need this EU Wallet for doing this? If I get some benefits, yeah, the people will, will go for that. I mean, that's how people are funding uh, 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 Starbucks. I mean, Starbucks are getting a lot of free money from these cards that are prepaid. Right? They don't have to go to the bank to loan money. They loan free from people, right? Fantastic. And people think they get benefits from this. If it's fun, a challenge on that, how, can, we, can we make it fun? Could we add something stupid fun stuff into the wallet to make people excited? Or could it make me safe? I travel a lot. Uh, these are the first two pages, so how many pages of my travel apps? And I happen to remember in the Netherlands, the travel app is called NS. It's the first one here, by the way. Uh, but, I mean, I'd challenge anybody in this room to map these 18 apps to 18 cities in Europe. In most cases, there, you know, you can't even guess where they belong. Some of them actually start with the right letter. This is Helsinki. It starts with an H. But I have a separate list of those because I need when I travel together. If I could have this travel thing in my wallet, that would simplify. Then again, I mean, in the Netherlands, I don't even need the app anymore. I just tap my credit card. So why do I need a wallet? I go to London, I just use my watch to travel. So wh what's the problem we're solving? Again, sorry for being the party pooper here. But this is actually one of the ones that have gotten people excited. I presented <laughs> and showed some of this at Köpenick Call uh, in Berlin, and, and this one people came and said, yeah, this would help. Same with parking. How many parking apps do you guys have? Or if you charge your electric car? Things like that. We were supposed to get control. <laughs> and we got this, right? Yeah. I mean, that was the argument behind the cookie law and the GDPR things, to give us control. <laughs> Thank you. Right? What if the wallet could be, and again, I hate the term wallet because it really, really doesn't describe it, has some intelligent agent that can give you an overview of this? Because I have no idea to whom I've given what consent right now. I mean, it's all over the place because you're on the mission to do something and you, you know, get rid of this stuff. What if the wallet could help me with doing this stuff? I get a full overview, I say, really? I shared this information with that party? Hey, hey, I'm you know, revoking that so I can just select someone, revoke them and do that. That could be useful if we could tell people, okay, you're gonna get rid of all these pop-ups. Yay, people are gonna love it. <laughs> Face-to-face -face verification could be an interesting use case. Uh, this is now happening. This is from the Freya app in Sweden. You can use that. Uh, you could scan this QR code, but it's going to say expired right now. 
a Swedish bank ID has come with the same, Norwegian bank ID come with the same thing. You just take your app and you show you can do a two-way verification. This could be an interesting use case. And also between people and businesses. So I know it's a genuine business. A lot of fraud cases are because somebody is pretending to be a business. Dating. Dating, exactly. Right. Right. And, you know, in cases, this shows, you know, my first name, last name, my age, and so on. Uh, but again, we could use limited disclosure on, on this as well. So this would, uh, could be an interesting use case. Um, I was challenged. Somebody was going to have a, a presentation internally in our organization for teenage girls interested in technology. And I was thinking, you know, what, what could be a good use case? They are heavily online users. What's the risk? Stalking, grooming, dating, fraud, etc. You know, the risk for that. Could we use this somehow to protect online fora? Saying, you know, you only get into this fora if you can prove you're a teenage girl. Right? But then back to step one. We need to have complete chain of trust so we know that it's not one of those teenage girls' dad that is using this. But th this could be uh, interesting, and of course, this holding accountable. And, and that's interesting. I'm working now with financial crime prevention. And on one side, we, uh, side we see the need for privacy, of course. But from a financial crime prevention point of view, we want as much data as possible. We want to be able to find out. We need all this metadata to see if there's a problem with this transaction, right? So there's a balance there. On one side, the need for privacy. On the other side, we want to catch the bad guys. And I've done some presentations on anonymity. And you know, ask people, you want to be anonymous? Yeah, 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 I want to be anonymous. Well, that means you also grant that right to the person that's stalking your teenage kids. You, you, you sort of can't have both. Um, <clears throat> then on my last presentation afterwards, somebody came over me and said, uh, give me another idea. And that's back to one of the success criteria for bank ID in Norway was it was adapted by the kids or the, the young people because it was made mandatory to get your student loan. Right? Clever, right? So in the student loan bank to get your student loan, you would have to use bank ID. And this was quite early. Um, and then you get all the younger generation using it and getting used it. And this was, what, 10, <coughs> 10 plus years ago or something like that. So the thought was uh, along the same line. What about kids in sport? Could that be a way to, to get the wallet into the young generation that will eventually grow up and, and get used to using it? They need identification. They belong to, to clubs. They have classifi classifications. Their kids, their coaches, their parents, they're going to sign up to events all these kind of things. You also have to do background checks on coaches and stuff like that. This could be an interesting use case to, to, to make people excited and, and get using on this. And then organizations. How to convince organizations to invest in the wallets? This is back to deciding, uh, you know, we're building the infrastructure. Uh, I'm talking to banks. How to convince the banks hey, you need to invest in this. We're building something we're calling roads. We think they're going to be OK. Maybe there are going to be some vehicles on them. And maybe you know, you're going to get some benefits from this. What makes organization excited? Well, if you can simplify. Uh, and on, on the travel use case, you mentioned uh, the, the, the visa and the, no, the, the passenger, the right to travel thing. And also on saving money. What about regulatory compliance? Can we build something in the wallets to, to help the organizations with, uh, with regulatory compliance? That would be something that would, if I could go to the bank and say, you know, with, with this new wallet that's coming, your regulatory compliance will be simplified. You can say, yeah, that would be a real incentive for them and security. So organizational wallets could also, <coughs> we also need, I mean, I want the story that I can go to the bank and tell, you know, this wallet is coming, it's going to look like this and this, and they're going to be dancing on the table, right? Then we've gotten software, then we have the incentive to, to get rolling on this. So uh, when I did this last, you know, there was a Q&A session, and I said, well, I'm going to ask the question now to the audience, right? Where's the excitement? 
How can we get the excitement outside the nerd community? And that's what I'm going to leave you with. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, and I think that's a very relevant question. Uh, last year you taught me that you can't have two different rules, one for criminals and one for ordinary people. That, that would be great because and especially in security control at airports. Yeah, that would be, that would be so lovely. Okay, with all the um, presenters finishing on time, I would like you guys, and there's even people standing in the back room to present ooh, the first question. Please um, tell me which presenter you've got a question for. Uh, actually, I would like to ask all three presenters about the following. In the first presentation, I see the statement. I'm sorry, my name is Oleg uh, Truviti. Um, my question is the following. Mobile driving license limiting use cases. Uh, I totally agree with this statement, but I would like to get some insights from presenters, I guess all three of them. Thank you. And your question is on mobile driving license? How exactly mobile driving license specification limiting use cases? Because everybody, all SSI company are looking for mobile driving license, like Spherion, some other companies. Uh, me personally thinks mobile driving license only provides a tunnel vision to SSI. But I see the same statement in the first presentation, and I would like I'm to know the opinion of presenters about that. Mobile driving license and limited. So that was about mobile driving license, just to be uh, honestly spoken, there was a lot spoken, but I did not get the actual point of the question. Mobile driving license? Yeah, yeah. mobile driving license in your presentation limiting use cases of SSI. So this is not necessarily good things, mobile driving license, if everybody focusing around mobile driving license. That's, that's correct? That's what you're telling me? Do, do, you do you mean that the privacy principles, by having a mobile driving license in your wallets, it means you have your identity in your wallets? Is that your question? Yes, yes that is true. But bear in mind, the European digital identity wallets, the core is the identity issued by your government to the citizen. There's nothing anonymous uh, or pseudonymous about that. And the same goes for your driving license. However, with the ISO MDL standard, you will be allowed to use selective disclosure um, when that's needed. But of course, if you are stopped by the police, um, Th there's no <laughs> there's no limitation on what you they want your full license don't worry especially if they think you've been drinking or speeding <laughs> and and also through with a you know car rental scenario i mean you need to prove that you're allowed to drive a car yeah. but i mean the car rental uh, company they would want to get the car back if something happens so you you know just proving that you're not allowed to or sorry you're allowed to drive wouldn't be sufficient let me rephrase my, my question. Okay, mobile driving license, B2C is uh, pretty cool, right? But what outside of this scenario? What about B2B relationship? What's the difference? So why everybody is telling about mobile driving license and OEDC for VCI, but nobody telling about DITCOM, DITCOM messaging? Okay, that's my turf. Um, yes, uh, EWC is very interesting because half of the people providing wallets and infrastructure are from the classical SSI world. And they often use ledger-based technologies um, where they use DIDs and DITCOM uh, for identifiers and trusts. And the other half come from the classical EID and trust services infrastructure and they refer to PKI and the European trust list. Yeah, getting them to talk together is very interesting because they use the same words, means something completely different. Now, what I can tell you on a base of the standards is that DID and DITCOM will be allowed. It won't be prohibited. However, most government organizations won't natively use that because it's not in their sphere of influence. Um, so uh, what we're trying to do is set up ecosystems that can you know, handle both worlds. And this is a steep learning curve for both sides, I can tell you. It's really interesting. But yeah, does that answer your question? Because we're not only talking about a driving license, we're talking about insurance cards, boarding passes, loyalty points, payments. Yes, please. Just, I, 
I believe I understand the question because I think the fact that the driver's license becomes a proxy for many other use cases that have nothing to do with driving, and is it that the footprint of the of using of the driver's use case may limit future take-ups? I think that's the that's kind of the essence of it. I think of, of uh, I remember back before I had a driver's license, but it was yeah, 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 yeah. So we're just going to ignore everything else. Yes, if if I understand correctly, right now we hand over our driver's license in many, many use cases that have nothing to do with driving. That's what you refer to. But we will not, actually we will, uh, that will cease to exist because we will have the pit for that. So we will use our pit to identify ourselves. And the driver's license will be used much less. And if we do use it, but you will have to share it uh, to to get a certain service, it will be with, I hope, when I take uh, data minimization, and uh, so we will only use what we have to use. But I think the interesting thing is, I think uh, the driver's license will mostly be used now for your for the police, uh, to rent a car. Uh, yeah, anyone who requests it, but it's up to you to share it. Do you wanna? No, I mean, the, the problem with, uh, with both uh, passports and, and driver license, they were never attended as identity documents. I mean, a driver license was intended to prove that you're allowed to drive. A passport was used to uh, prove that you could travel, right? But they have sort of just converged into identity documents in lack of something else. My name is Gerard Hartzink. I have a question for Annette Steenberger on the payment of the consortium. Um, um, I'm also involved in the digital euro program of the European Central Bank as an advisor. So how do you foresee that the consortium can create a world that all merchants and digital e-merchants e and POS merchants and vending machines accept this digital wallet? Because that means that they have to upgrade uh, their uh, mobile environment or uh, POS terminal to the standard, whatever the standard may be. How do, do you foresee the consortium? It's very complex. I'm going to give it straight to Esther. <laughs> and thank you. Okay, first of all, now first of all, there's two consortia working on payments. So EWC is looking at the payments supporting, especially the, the travel use case, but also the organizational identity, so uh, tenders. Um, there's no vending machines involved yet. Uh, however, your question is very is very relevant. Yeah, 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 exactly. And try to book a flight without your credit card. So we've got uh, Visa uh, on board and some of the larger banks. Um, right now, what we're uh, looking at is what can and cannot be done. And to be honest, uh, what I foresee is a world where there's a coexistence of uh, the traditional bank and card and payment apps leveraging uh, on the European wallet for identity and for combining identity into the payment transaction and tokenizing the cards. Yeah. Um, the European Union decided to have the digital euro program among more for strategic autonomy to get rid of Visa MasterCard. And I understand that you're mentioning Visa MasterCard networks that apparently this program is linking to the Visa MasterCard network. Yeah, th that's right, because um, uh, similar to vending machines, the uh, airline uh, uh, infrastructure isn't going to just throw everything out they have and are relying on card payments a lot. So if we ignore them, then we're sort of disqualifying the whole travel industry right now. Uh, however, NoBid um, is more focusing on getting uh, uh, solutions for transactions that are not involving big tech platforms and, and card platforms. So it'll be very interesting. This is also why the LSPs are relevant. It's not just a show and tell of, you know, this is how it's done. It's also figuring out how this is done. And um, yeah, let's see where they end up. Hello, my name is Boris Gardner from Ubiqu. Uh, I want to do to two, two remarks. So the first one is how to get people excited, right? And uh, uh, normally, uh, uh, nowadays, I tell at parties, what do you do? And I say, we enable you to load your passport or your mobile phone and have a reusable digital identity that you can use to cross borders. And that really excites people. 
but m maybe only 80%, but there's 20% that don't trust government, so that there, there's a problem there. That's the first thing. So that, uh, and really, that, that's anecdotal, of course. I mean, it's not scientifically, but, but uh, that's one thing. The second thing is, is that you're, uh, you are asking, uh, why do we need wallets? And the answer is actually a bit technical, is whenever we have a successful uh, uh, infrastructure in place right now, it's always federated. That means it is extremely complex to bootstrap. Right? And where wallets are liberating us at the moment, but we shouldn't call it decentralized, we should call it decoupled. We decouple the verifiers from the issuers. We decouple, basically, we create a internet scale uh, infrastructure where you don't need an end faculty of uh, connections between organizations to make it work. Of course, we have other issues, but that's the biggest driver where we're liberating ourselves from the technological complexity where we're making it simpler so we can scale it, if you agree at least. Yeah, so um, the problem with the story is telling that to users, right? You, you, that, that, I mean, they're not, I mean, gonna understand or care. Uh, it could work for organizations. Right? You can tell them this will, will simplify uh, uh, what you're doing, right? And simplification is definitely one of the use cases for, uh, for organizations. No, it is, it's, it's decoupling organizations from each other. They don't need to cooperate. Uh, exactly. So it makes the ecosystem less complex to scale the ecosystem as a whole. Okay, since we're between you all and lunch, these are the two final questions. And if someone explodes, <laughs> I might allow another one. <laughs> I have two questions, one to you, Eric, and one to uh, you, Annette. Uh, at one of the last uh, sheets you've shown, you, I don't know whether it was intentionally, or that you, you, you used the term DIW instead of EU. So are you tr trying to get us to grasp that it will be yes, that it will be for use all across the world, or are you just, is it your impression of this was an the EU uh, there was no uh, no intention in, in using just that I mean I mean me in the EU I'm just use it for short I was lazy sorry <laughs> okay that's solved then and the other one I uh, I work with together with uh, the Marche for future borders and I was sort of well I'm very interested in that you see the EU wallets within large-scale pilots as a means to travel outside Europe, because I always thought it was intended inside Europe. And then you don't need as much as you just presented now. So that's also a world thing instead of a European thing. Um, <laughs> yes, a, a, a very, very good question. Um, we'll talk more after this, because I worked with Marcia Say for a long time uh, as well. Uh, and future borders are extremely important. Um, if we travel, we, we cannot only, it, it's, it's totally useless to look only, uh, not, well, that's a bold statement, but it's, it's really limited and it's, it's very narrow to only look at Europe. Because um, we are basically, there's, there, like I said in my presentation, uh, the systems we use and the way we board a flight, the way we issue uh, travel uh, uh, cred or, cred or uh, credentials or uh, like a boarding card, etc. It's based on more global standards. So you might as well uh, cover that as well. Also, there is the ICAO digital travel credential. We need to do something with that. The commission is looking at, 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 at what is pi has been piloting this as well. Mm -hmm. The, the Marshall State knows this very well. So um, it, oh, it there is no travel without looking extra EU. Plus, you have to prepare. The, this is this is all about scaling, and we have to look at you. Know, you'll fly Madrid, uh, Amsterdam, New York. Uh, that's what we uh, want to do. So uh, we have to look global. Yes, there is, but we'll talk later. Yeah, no. Once you start traveling, this becomes contagious. Uh, that's oh, by the way, latest rumors are that the member states are very open to accepting ICAO DTC as a standard to go for it, the member states. Yes. Yeah. So that's a good sign. Um, hello, I'm uh, Roger Oliveira. I'm from Verid. Um, so we're talking about large kill pilots, um, but there's also going to be small scale pilots. And you just said 
uh, what is an, an interesting use case for adoption. And we are going to be involved together with some people from EWC uh, in travel credentials for festivals. So festivals is a, a very large use case in uh, Europe where people travel all around Europe to go to Tomorrowland or to Seaget Festival. And in that uh, tra travel use case, you could have a very important credential that young people would love to have in their wallet, which is the ticket. Because there is a lot of problems about ticketing. Uh, and we just found out that a lot of festival organizers are really, really keen in uh, getting involved in this. And uh, we're going to announce it at Eurosonic Norderslag, which is the biggest uh, event uh, conference in, the, in Europe. Uh, it's one of those things that could maybe help with adoption in a in small size. I, I, I like that one, and that also appeals to the. I have a microphone here. Yeah, so it appeals to the younger generation as well. So, thank you for answering my yeah, question. Yeah, no, it's great. What we've seen, we've had some. I remember you now from Berlin. Yeah. <laughs> I remember setting this, you talking to Jen about this, because uh, Jen Digital, together with the Greek Ferries, did a first pilot on a different technology stack with students. And the good thing, and this ties into your presentation, Jörg, is when asked previously, do you want a wallet, do you need a wallet, they were like, no, why? <laughs> and then afterwards, because they could board ferries and an event with it, they were like, why hasn't this been around? What, can I use it elsewhere? And the answer is no, sadly. So yeah, talk about excitement. Let them yep. experience it. Thank you, everyone. Find them online. Find them during lunch for other questions. And, um, and thank you for paying attention. Uh,